Perfect. Get that right. All right, we'll do a better job this time than last time. We actually have a projector that works. <clears throat> All right, uh, well, small group, but welcome to the WordPress meetup for this month. I'm John Overall from johnoverall.com, uh, specialized in WordPress, have been focused on WordPress for well over 10 years, been in the internet for 20 plus years now. I'll be giving the second presentation today discussing how to choose a theme for your WordPress website. First up though, we have Sean DeWolf from Sean DeWolf Consulting, who will be talking to us about Gravity Forms and all the cool things you can do with Gravity Forms. So, welcome to the stage, Sean. Thank you, John. Thank you. So, thanks everyone. Um, still have a seat, so. Have a seat. You could grab a seat. I'll park my car. Okay, yeah. So, tonight's talk, I wanted to talk about Gravity Forms and what makes them cool and what makes them a really awesome add-on to uh, any sort of WordPress install. So first off, myself, as John said earlier, I've got into WordPress about a little while back, around 2011. I got into web development back in 1996 and I've been programming since 1984, so I've been doing tech for a, time, for a long time. Um, for those of you who don't know what Gravity Forms is, Gravity Forms is a premium plugin that comes from Rocket Genius. Rocket Genius, I think at some point had more products, but they've since zeroed in on Gravity Forms as their flagship product. And what it does is it, um, it allows you to add, and add a form builder, and a form builder that can be extended out to satisfy a whole bunch of roles, and we'll get into some of those roles tonight. Uh, as I said, it's it's a premium plugin, so if you're used to the free plugins or the premium, where some of them are free and some of them um, cost to get the extra features, with uh, Gravity Forms, they all uh, Gravity Forms has a licensing model that ranges from fifty nine dollars for a basic subscription, all the way up to uh, a, an elite subscription that gets you all the bells and whistles and all the goodies for two fifty nine per year. The yearly subscription implies that it's going to have a level of support, software updates as they come, other sorts of stuff. I mean, you can get it for one year and just kind of keep with that old install, but that just means that you're not on board for security updates. So I always recommend if somebody gets into Gravity Forms, they get into at one of these service levels. And if somebody's a developer, I always really push that they get into the Elite subscription because it's almost the price of the middle tier subscription which I didn't even mention here. Um, and it is there and it gives you access to everything that they can do. So this is just the example of the basics of what Gravity Forms can do. As said, it's a form builder, has a lot of flexibility and interactivity built into it. It allows for you to build conditional logic into your form so one answer can influence it in question or an answer can influence where the form may go. It does online, it does real-time calculations through JavaScript inside of the client so it doesn't have to go to your website, come back with an answer. It can pack all those answers along with it and give you give users that immediacy that they may really like. Uh, some of the examples I'm going to show off in this are, are really good about demonstrating just how much you can get out of a Gravity Forms install. Uh, this is kind of their intro video or intro walkthrough where it talks about uh, all the sort of add-ons available, all the sort of ways to extend out Gravity Forms and get more, more stuff going on. And this is a list here of what sort of add-ons they come with. And it integrates with mailing systems like Aweber, uh, MailChimp, Active Domain. I'm currently doing stuff with something called HubSpot that does customer nurturing, integrates with that. As you go up the levels from basic to pro to elite, you get more elaborate and tricked out add-ons. So Dropbox, for example, you can integrate a Dropbox and people can submit documents and files and they can get actually put into Dropbox and, and put in a fairly safe way. The elite level has extra goodies that really extend out how it behaves, what it has, So the other nice thing they have 
Because they've got a built into the system, like you, similar to how you grab other WordPress plugins, they give you a download link that you can bring the zip file to your desktop, add it to your uh, install. They give you a license key that you put in to validate that you've got a premium subscription and all is well. And then you can just get going with making form. The thing is they've got all the form field potentials over on one side and you can just drag and drop fields into place. You can pop open the field and edit all the attributes and put in your stuff. It's, it's pretty intuitive in, in how it works. Um, in this example, it's uh, going through how you can affect the appearance and make uh, put in pieces of CSS, put in references to CSS and, and do stuff to connect it with the rest of your site so that way it doesn't look significantly different from the rest of your site, it kind of stitches right into your design. <clears throat> and uh, beyond that, that's an example of the functionality where it can uh, allow you to duplicate fields. So if you have one field and you say, well, I've got these six or seven types of fields that behave in a similar way, well, I'm just gonna make a real a good master one in your form and then duplicate them so you don't have to go from scratch on each and every one of those. And if you don't like one, it's easy to delete inside of the experience. The other piece is if, when, a, when a form submission comes in, it can um, connect via confirmation so you can say thank you for your submission or it can send you to a different page or it can even send you to a different website altogether. Uh, one example I'll touch upon, it sends you off to PayPal so you can go through and try to do a PayPal transaction and then come back. Uh, the other thing too is it can do notifications to people. So when somebody sends when somebody does the submission, the notification can go to the end user by an email saying, hey, thank you, and put in other con touch points and details, like, hey, thank you, maybe we've attached a PDF to the document, maybe we've got more information from the user. There's a way to put in conditional logic into that notification step, so you could have one message go to your admin person who receives all the form submissions, and then something that's a lot more user-friendly goes to the end user, and that way, you could just you could just really tailor the message about who gets what. Form submissions, likewise, like the details of the form submissions, can influence who gets those form submissions. This is an example of one of the forms where we just put in the conditional logic of what's available, and that influences where the where the submission is going to go. You can craft your message in there, you can put anything into there, it's just like a post editor in WordPress that lets you do the same thing. Um, pack in other form variables, it's, it's really, really handy. This other side here, uh, PDF, Pop-Up Maker, HubSpot, MailChimp, that's an example of some of the other integrations I've got in this example. And this one I really like called Gravity Forms, and, or Gravity PDF. Gravity PDF is an add-on that comes from a third party, and what it allows you to do is generate a PDF coupled to a submission when somebody makes a form submission. In the case of this client, we have it that it creates a PDF that gives them a quote based on what values they put into their, into their submission. So they have something, in, and in this case, uh, because this client uh, usually gives these sort of documents to somebody as they start a bid or procurement process, it gives them a complete procurement start, so that way they can say, oh, I need this document to put into my bigger bid proposal. Well, we give them the documents dynamically built based on what their form submission was. Um, the other piece I'm touching on here is uh, MailChimp, where it integrates with MailChimp, and you can have somebody auto-subscribe to a MailChimp group based on a form submission. And depending on what their answers are, you could have them go to one form submission, one mailing list in MailChimp, or a different mailing list in MailChimp. Inside of the admin screen, this is an example of what the entries look like when they come in and sort of your big sheets and your, your posts page or, or um, a kind of a dashboard. And what this lets you do is it lets you choose what columns are, are showing off and what columns are considered relevant or important. 
Um, I just threw this in here as a uh, overview of what sort of settings are, are up for grabs inside of inside of Gravity Forms. And as you get add-ons and as you get extensions, all those things are available in the control panel, so that way you can you can integrate with these other services, put in API credentials, or put in your login with Dropbox, or your login with Mailchimp. That's a nice little feature too, the web API. If you really want to do a deep dive into how Mailchimp integrates, or sorry, Gravity Forms integrates with your stuff, it can, um, actually tie in through what's called an application programming interface. And that lets data that's inside of Gravity Forms integrate with something else in the third party. So it could be something else in a bigger organization, could be another organization. The sky's the limit when you get into tying in with an API. The other piece you can do too is you can import and export forms. So you can import forms from other people. You can uh, make a copy of the form and import and tweak it so we can have two forms that have similar roles but are different. And you can export roles. This is a, an example of how easy it is to integrate those third-party built-in add-ons. And what they've done is inside the Gravity Forms experience, instead of going to like the WordPress.org um, plugin picker or downloading these things and getting them integrated, they're all available here inside of Gravity Forms, so you can just a la carte pick which ones you want to add to your system, and then it just extends out what Gravity Forms can do. This is an example of um, inline calculations that I've done for one of my clients. Uh, what they have here is they want to do an estimation product, so or an estimation system, so that somebody will say, "Well, I'm I'm at I'm in Vegas and um, I have a area this big and I need the lighting for that." So what it does is it lets them choose the project that they're talking about, so that they can reference it later. Um, uses a grab or uses a Google Maps tie-in, and that lets them pick where their stuff is, and you can put in your street address, or you can just drag and drop the pointer and end up with the best guess. Because really, the latitude from North Vegas to South Vegas isn't really going to change, so you don't know need to be so accurate. Plug in your dimensions, in this case, to get an estimate coming back. In this case, it gives us what the pricing is like, ways to get into additional contacts. But the other thing it does is that, let me scroll back up. It takes this form submission and lets you bundle it as uh, values in a form submission on another page and goes to this page where it, it has all those settings from the previous page and lets you tinker with variables. So that way you can say, well, compare it to another project with standard lighting, and you can put in how many street lamps you've got, and how much you, you've been quoted for digging, and all this sort of stuff. And Gravity Forms will do the calculation and let somebody see immediately what the price is. So this can be done for anything like a loan calculator or a mortgage calculator. It can be done for an estimate of repairs or something. If, if you know enough of the variables to plug in, and you're safe with handing over that control to the end user, you could plug in all those things and make it a very self-serve form because then it helps people convince themselves that, that what they're seeing is good value and then they can they can engage with you. What site is that? What was that? What site is that? So oh, that one? That's uh, solarlighting.com. Solarlighting. Yeah. So another example of a site I did. Um, and here we've got this calculator, it's still kind of a work in progress, so I won't show you the tail end of the process, but this is an example of how much control you have over the styling of a gravity form. So that's a radio box, that's a set of radio buttons there, although they look nothing like that. Those are also radio buttons. So because you can affect the styling, you can start with anything, and it can look like it can be a form, but it doesn't have to look like a form. So it gives somebody all the interactivity you're hoping to deliver to them without it looking like they're kind of doing their taxes. So that's kind of a, a nice way to dress it up and, and still provide the interactivity in a way that basically it gives you data you could trap into. Um, <coughs> pardon me.
pardon me. Another nice thing too is with gravity forms is sometimes you get those great big long, looks like you're doing your taxes length forms. And what this does is it lets you break it down and do multi-page forms. The multi-page form has two nice features. One of them is it breaks it out into the pieces that are nice chunks, has to progress far along the way to let people know how far they've gone. But the other piece too is at the bottom of each of these pages you have the option of saying save and continue later. So they end up getting a little token or a little URL they can use later on and come back and pick up their form submission halfway through. So for example, if you had a really complex form or something where it's like, oh, I gotta go and dig through my records now, they could save and continue later, go and get whatever else they need to complete a submission, come back, pick up where they left off, and complete their submission. So they don't have to kind of keep the browser open and keep the computer on and all the stuff that may get in the way. Um, the other thing I did with this particular form is it goes through multiple pages of trying to get information about somebody who's preparing an ebook and help them build an ebook website. And when you get towards the tail end of the process, it will give them an uh, estimate, like it breaks down exactly the cost they have for that ebook uh, website. And if they say go, it takes them off to the PayPal where they can pay for it. And PayPal will send a signal back to Gravity Forms and that will get updated in your Gravity Forms submission. So you'll know whether or not somebody went through the whole process, went off to a third party payment processor. In this case, it's PayPal, but you can use the authorized.net and there's other e-commerce providers to integrate and come back, you know, will this person pay? So maybe it's an order where you get all the details, but you just don't want, you only want to process the orders of people who have paid. So this lets you go all the way through the process and, and kind of pre-qualify people at the tail end of it. Again, I've put in a whole bunch of options, a whole bunch of pages. And there, because of the calcul built-in calculation function, I've got a lump sum and a monthly, and then the two calculations are different based on what somebody has decided to do at that last step in the process of saying, well, I want to pay up front, or I do want to just spread it out over so many months. So it gives somebody a, a way to get to even make some of those decisions even late in the process. This is another example, and this site went through some evolution. So um, at one point we said, oh, we're gonna estimate the price. We're gonna give everyone the final price. We're gonna let them choose the options and get the price they want. And then midway through the project, they changed their mind and said, well, we kinda don't wanna give them the price. We want them to contact us. So, so uh, we had some form variables in there, and we hid them, and later on we'll come back and we'll put them back in. But what this does, it lets them Choose the options that are available for a particular product. Again, that shows off and demonstrates how you can really control the formatting so it looks, it doesn't have to look like a regular form. And then uh, those fields appear after the fact. So those fields are holding until you get to a point you say, email my configuration, and only then does it give you the other piece of asking for your name and your email and everything else. So that way there's not too much clutter on the screen. So you can kind of lead them by the hand and say, I've done this piece, now we're ready to show you the next piece. And in this case, what this does is, once the submission's done and somebody sends, or puts in their email address, it allows them to go through and do further actions based on that initial action. It will also send the person that email that gives them the attachment of what they've currently quoted out, but it, also packs along other attachments that are relevant to the, to the end user. So you can say, here's general guidelines on something. So you can do helper documents that are kind of general going along with specific to what you want to say. And that's that latter piece about attaching the document. That's the um, gravity PDF kind of at work. Yeah, there's an example. And I don't know how interesting this last piece is, but from a coding perspective, it's pretty cool. In that WordPress really does a lot of its um, important heavy lifting through two systems that allow it to extend out functionality. 
and those are called filters, and there's actions. And Gravity Forms has almost every little piece of it available as a filter. So that means anything you see as a feature inside of Gravity Forms, you can probably, as a developer, pop the hood and put in more stuff. So you can have it do more goodies afterwards. So you can say, oh, well, this will never integrate with the user sign up. Well, it's like, no, that's really easy. Or this will never let somebody create a post but have the post held until approval. Well, no, that actually is also easy. And it, it extends it out and gives you a lot of control. And, and basically, if you're trying to jump that gap between an admin who has all the rights and it's a very you know, rarefied uh, role because you don't want everybody being an admin, and the general public who could make posts and then you leave posts in the system or it's a paper post or something, then this would give you a way to have that cake and eat it too. You'd be able to have a form, let people interact as much as they want, and then you'd say, okay, well now I've got something controllable that I can, I can do something with after the fact. Because you could put in something here and says you've got their submission and you want to add, add a step afterwards. And Gravity Forms would let you do that. So yeah, that's the essence of what Gravity Forms is, and I'm totally keen to take questions. Where at do you plug in all of the uh, variables? The variables? Yeah, for creating the calculator and stuff. Is that something additional code you have to write for it? Uh, no, actually, I, I didn't walk through that explicitly, but what it is is inside of almost all the fields, especially those that are numeric, they'll have an enable calculation section. And inside of there, you can pop open the field and you can um, put in formulas. And then the formula, formula is cribbed from other values available in the, in the general form. So if you have one thing for like, um, I don't know, um, length and the thing for width, then you can take those two form values and plug them into the calculations piece and come up with something. And then what you get out of that calculation in turn can be used in another piece. So, that part. Yeah, it's it's really handy and it's really turnkey. And the total customization of the uh, of the uh, radio buttons there—that's all pure CSS, right? Oh yeah, it's all just CSS. Yeah. What and it is is did you for did you assign how did you you assign a, a class to that particular field? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So what it is, you assign a class to the field, okay. and then you. Um, and then you do some stuff to mask the behavior and make it that everything you um, click on the graphic counts as, as good as a radio button click. Okay. So. I've extended gravity forms that far, but I'm probably going to now. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Like I, I, I've got a lot of mileage on the gravity forms. So what other, what other uses do you have for us? Oh, so I just had a question. Yeah, yeah. I'm not even sure that this is going to be wrong. No, no. I think like Airbnb, where people are inputting stuff and putting it into a database and then pulling it yeah. In this to something similar? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You could, um, in fact, I mean, Airbnb's kind of cornered that piece, you know, that segment. But if you said you wanted to still do your own, build an Airbnb form where you do a booking form, and it should be pretty straightforward to do the booking form because it, it kind of does nice bundles where it has contact as, instead of name and address and all that stuff. <coughs> it will combine multiple um, pieces of stuff that's always in the contact their name, their address, maybe. Code and that's all in one bundle. So you just say, Give me the contact piece, and then you can do the contact piece, and then you can see what nights are for grabs. And you could have that integrate with something else where maybe it looks up posts. You know, that's getting a little deep, but you look up what, what nights are booked out, and then give the user the only nights that are still available. And because of calculations in the mix, you could calculate it and say, Well, this is a weekend, and a weekend around Christmas may be a little higher of a bump than like a weekday in January. So you could tweak out and give them a price that's responsive to what you want it to be. So on this, where would you rate this as ease of use? Not for a programmer, because I, you know, you're, you're a programmer. Yeah. Like gravity forms, you know, I, A, I looked it up while I was sitting here. It's expensive. Well, it ranges from $59 a year up to $259 a year. And at 59, you don't get all the add-ons. You don't get the add-ons. You, you get most of the functionality. You just don't get the really good extensions, like the stuff that goes into like the web API and authorized.net. Yeah. And, and they're really tricked out ones. But at the lower levels, you get stuff like MailChimp and PayPal. So at least that stuff's up for grabs. 
how hard, how, what's the program of those? Because I'm going to, I couldn't find the place, so yeah. I got lost. I'm That's okay. Late. I missed the start, sorry. That's okay. Uh, where would you put this in the scale of, you know, I'm not a computer programmer, because I, what I heard of you doing, you're like, I need to do this, and then this, and then, and I'm like. The deep dive stuff in the last page where it integrates to everything else, that's developer land. But right. short of that, uh, the stuff where you just want to plunk in the fields and you know the numeric field, you know the drop down, you know you have the options for like small, medium, large. Um, that stuff is very approachable. And then you get to the calculation piece, which where you can you can say enable calculations, and then it has a little form box, and it's kind of like a really it's like a three dollar version of Excel, right? It's it's right. a little box, and you can drag and drop in formula pieces, and you can wrap them in. in Brackets, so you can say you know this times three divided by four, you know all that all that sort of jazz, um, and then factor in the other variables in the form submission, and that's that's just about as tricky as using basic Excel. Okay. Yeah, and when you get to the formatting piece, that's a finesse too, because if you're really good at knowing styling and see and cascading style sheets, um, it works really great. But if you're still if you don't have that, you can still come up with a serviceable form that looks like a it's my experience and maybe my client's experience with gravity forms. It's very easy to use for all basic forms and all forms. And most themes, when you plug gravity forms into it, they'll come out looking really well in the theme. And there's almost nothing that has to be done until you start going to customize it. Exactly. And you get a lot of legwork. Like I've been using gravity forms since they first came online. I'm grandfathered in. As long as I pay my license fee every year, I get the $259 one for 90 bucks. Nice. Because I bought it back when they were a new company, and they're one of the few companies that honored their nice. early licensees. So, but yeah, it's like it's a fantastic book, and it just makes it easy. Is there another one that's free that you would? There's there's uh, Contact Form Sevens, but Contact Form Seven, which is the most popular free one. And then there's uh, there's zombie, formidable forms. I can use that. Formidable zombie forms, but yeah. What happens is you'll find that after a while you'll want gravity forms anyway because those forms are not very effective. Their their updates often break things, and they're a lot harder to build the form than gravity forms. Gravity forms is literally drag and drop the pieces you want, make the quick changes in it, save it, go to your page, insert form, choose the form. Poof, it's done. Yeah. Whereas, like Contact Form Seven, you've got to figure out their code to build the form. And as the name implies, Contact Form Vet Form. Contact Form Seven works best as a Contact Form. As soon as yeah. you move away from Contact yeah. Form, you start to move away that's, from its really intended. And that's the thing that Gravity Forms. I use Gravity Forms myself for um, <clears throat> sign up forms. I use it for clients who have big, long, as he talked about, the multi part forms. I use it for those when they're they need applications filling. And if you've got a good, well, everyone should have an SSL site now, the information is transmitted securely and it's protected. And the nice thing about Gravity Forms versus every other plugin is Gravity Forms keeps a copy of every form submission in your web database. Yeah. So if you don't get the email, but they get it, go why didn't you get it? You can log into your website and you'll find that submitted. Well, and I didn't cover off this piece, but what it can also do is there's a section in the notifications for an entry. And when you make an entry, you, there's two buttons there. All the buttons, all the notification points you've put into your system, you can have it do another notification to that end user. Yeah. So if, if there's a glitch in your mail system or their mail system, and you discover this a couple weeks later, you just go mail notification. With GDPR though, they're kind of frowning upon retaining data. So if that's the case, there is a plug, there are actually two plugins. They have a way to, they have a that way to let you kill months. entries, yeah. And those you can time, it'll just kill the entry four days from now, or, or a month from now. Yeah. So that way you can keep it around for the just in case, but you can also kill it so the GDPR doesn't decimate your business. Yeah. GDPR being? The General Data Protection Rules. Global uh, UK Data Protection Rules. Global Racket. Data. Yeah. The global Data Protection Racket. That's it. Um, <laughs> And they and they're based out of UK legislation, but everyone is UK legislation. It is, but everyone's going to adopt the same legislation. Eventually, unfortunately, so it's kind of the thing you got to get on board with. Yeah. 
Um, you mentioned about the CSS. Is it, uh, is it like the MailChimp and it's all sort of takes just in line and tables, or is it more standard the CSS? How it kicks it out is it kicks it out in divs, and then all the form areas have a place to put in a CSS class. Mm -hmm. So you name the class whatever, including if there's a class already used in your in your theme, you could just use that naming, and then it'll, it'll adopt the theming. It has lots and lots of layers of theming or, or styling on top of it, mm -hmm. which makes it kind of a little complex to dig into, mm -hmm. but it means it's really controllable. Is it, is it as messy as, say, a MailChimp kind of thing, which is all in line and tables? Is it? Uh, not tables, because it's got divs, it usually wraps like it usually does, like, um, and it's got the entirety of the form. Each page has its segment, each form value, each form area has its segment, then label, um, the, the heading, the label, the description, the input, those all have their own segments, and then there's a couple layers in each of those. So it's a, it's a pretty thick onion, but there's, mm -hmm. you can definitely do cool. stuff with it. Well, no, thank you. No, no, there you are. Question. Silly. Okay. Uh, I'm not familiar with gravity forms, but based on, I mean, can it tie into um, uh, a bit more of your social media sort of program? Does it, is there a way to uh, hook it into, say, uh, Instagram if somebody post something and you want to have the option to give them a, a little feedback or a, you know, some gift or something. I haven't seen that integration, but all the potential is there because you can integrate to Instagram via an API, right. Gravity Forms can go via an API, Gravity Forms can do file uploads, right. Gravity Forms can pass off that image to a third party, like for example, um, you can do custom image format types when Instagram is 640 by 640. So you could do something in there that says, upload this image and then treat it like media. And then there's a custom sizing, and you go, well, we're gonna knock that to 640 by 640 or crop or whatever the logic may be. And then that image is available as a resource, and then something after the fact on the submission could, could then push it to Instagram. So you want to use the API for that. Is there, is there a way to do something in a basic, let's say for instance, just blue skirt. Yeah. Right now, someone posts something on your blog post. You want to give them a, a, whatever, a free gift. Yeah. You know, oh, you totally do that. Yeah. 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 On the basic or, or just with the extended? Uh, oh, no, with the, with the basic. What, what that process would be is you build up the basic gravity form. You have a notification step at the tail end of the process. So once they make their submission, you do the upload or whatever, whatever you put into the form submission. Then the notification will come to them and it will say, hey, thank you, whatever language you want. You can even crib from the submission to reference it. Yeah. And then you say, and here's your freebie. And your freebie could be anything. It could be a hyperlink um, in the Gravity PDF. The Gravity PDF is a free plugin, for instance. Um, that could be a PDF you plug, you attach. Right. And then that just um, they say, hey, here's your free certificate. Any problems mobile? Uh, no, because it's, it's, they say they're out of the box, it's built to be responsive, so it's just kind of at the borders of what your styling is like. So, uh, in case anyone wants to get in touch with me after this, apart from talking and all here, no problem with that. Uh, those are my points of contact. My website is seandewolf.com, sean at seandewolf.com, and Twitter at dewolf001. If you want to hear me Twitter, you want to send me a message or follow or whatever. And here we go. Thank you for the time, John. All right, well, thank you, Sean. I appreciate it. My pleasure, sir. Okay, and with that, well, we'll take a take a five minute break here, and uh, before I move to the next presentation, uh, thanks for. We actually have people out there on Twitter or hey. on uh, YouTube, so we had a couple people show up. So awesome. Uh, so yeah, five minutes, and then I'll come in and do my presentation on choosing WordPress themes and what you need and what you should do. And for those on YouTube, we'll be back shortly.
Yeah, of course. Yeah. I'm not sure what this is. I saw something that looked interesting. It was called okay. Bells. I'm um, Bells, yeah. It's, um, it's um, Landing pages. Landing pages, yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 Quite like pages or landing pages. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't quite figure out how it lived all the things or the respective WordPress. It's yeah. its own It's its own thing. Right. Um, but a lot of places will do this where they'll let out a, a subdomain or a particular address right. and to push people there to marketing campaigns and line up with unbound to go and do a new capture and push them in some way else. But they're not going to do it. So you can squeeze them a little yeah. bit, and then maybe send them back to the initial. Exactly. Like the one plan I showed off a few examples of, um, they have like a whole bunch of verticals, but all of them go to info dot, and then that's the HubSpot website. Right. And you just set up the DNS to say, yeah, we own this domain, but everyone goes right. to HubSpot for this. So like HubSpot's the same sort of things like, like, like a Microsoft business. Yeah, so, yeah. What HubSpot does is it's about customer nurturing, so you can get someone to contact. Right. And you can see how often you contact them. And you go to the sales phone and you say, this guy we talked to last year, or one month ago, or this guy keeps it in the site every week. We want to talk to him. Really like any, any? Uh, John, it's far side of the far side of this downstairs. And you would have to send them to two different ones. You'd have to send them to HubSpot to get them sort of analytics, or you could get them through the rest of the, the, the website. HubSpot, HubSpot itself has its analytics, and it goes into a really in-depth picture of them. Because right. what it does, it kind of freaks me out, you know, when you talk about tracking a lot of user data, you know, crazy user data. Right. So um, it records all their interactions, references all the interactions, and if they start visiting the site before we knew who they were, you know, as soon as there's a cookie attached to who they were, it then goes, oh, well, this guy was looking at this stuff the last three weeks, but now we know who he is. not good for my camera lens. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's great if you're marketing, but it really freaks me out. Yeah. You know, I've got my I guess I don't know, so I need to be sure. Yeah, so, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, HubSpot is key. There's, there's freebie plans for HubSpot, um, and there's HubSpot plans that go up with how much interaction you have with client channel right. or lead channel. Right. And it, it's, it's, we've been using it in this one place, and it's really, really good. So if one was, say, um, I don't do a little marketing myself, which is a mistake, but I've seen one of my girlfriends who organizes, um, Writing retreats in mm -hmm. Europe, so we'd be doing Mailchimp pushes, right? Yeah. Maybe it's more interesting to send them to, you know, a lead capture thing a bit more aggressively than HubSpot. HubSpot may be better, just because well, Mailchimp is great for being able to figure out the funnels from the long run. Right. So on picture, yeah. So yeah. yeah. So instead, you you, you dial in what they're checking out on the site, mm -hmm. and the one <coughs> guy always checks out. Um, our, this guy may have signed up for the fiction thing, mm -hmm. but he's always looking at non-fiction stuff. So maybe you want to go to that person and reach out and go, you know we've got non-fiction thing coming next month. Mm -hmm. And then that that may be telling, you know, sit, leading them a little bit. It's all about nurturing. Right. Right. Yeah. got to tinker with Gravity Forms a little bit, you just discover they could do a lot. Gravity Forms is an amazing plugin. Yeah. yeah. And and really, it, if it's just for your site, it's 59 bucks a year, so it's, yeah. it doesn't really break the bank. Yeah, when I look at the add-on things, when I went to Gravity Forms, I was looking at something, wow, some of these better add-ons, I don't know what's for sure the add-ons are, but the stuff that says survey and quiz, yeah. they're all on the Elite. They are. They are. They are, but... Those are the best things there are. But yeah. you may not really need them. You really just yeah. want to get people's feedback. And and mm -hmm. most of the stuff in a survey and a quiz, you kind of don't, you don't really need it. You can do that with basic gravity forms that are really great in the band company. Another nice thing about it, too, is if you start with the regular license and you decide you need to upgrade, they don't charge you. They only charge you the difference in the price. But it's a year. It's a year. It's an annual fee. Yeah. It, 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 all plugins and themes and things now have finally hit the point where they're annual fees. Many, many of those companies and organizations started out by charging lifetime licenses. 
which is why I have certain licenses because they still honor them, but they realize that's not a sustainable business model, a lifetime license, because they're people buy the license and then they got to continue to support that product. Yeah, they have to kick out updates. And they got to kick out updates are, and that, that costs money. Are themes yearly? What's that? Themes. Some of the premium themes are. Well, premium I, themes I, I are yearly. A couple of premium themes if you buy them yearly. from, if you buy them from Theme Forest where I buy mine, you pay once, you get the code, but after six months you can no longer get any support right. unless you renew and pay the support fee. So a lot of them, they finally revised their business models to where they're getting the regular fees coming in to help them sustain their business. And a few of the companies, like I bought some stuff with WooCommerce back when they used to charge uh, a lifetime license. And then when they changed it, they didn't, they didn't want to grandfather everyone in for all the lifetime licenses, but they did. So all the stuff that was bought lifetime was grandfathered in. So I've got a lot with multiple companies out there where I bought lifetime licenses. And about half the companies honored the original agreement and grandfathered me in. The other half of the companies went, yeah, screw you, we're breaking the agreement. And those companies there, I just completely abandoned them after they did that to me. Because I said, they'll do that and they'll do anything. Because you know, they won't honor the original agreement. I can understand changing the prices, but the people who help get you up off the ground, you need to honor them. Flip side is they sold too many too fast or the late night. You just yep. went bankrupt anyways. Yeah, well, there's that too. You know, it's, there's that too. I'm not breaking agreements ever, but I see that. I see oh. the dilemma they got themselves into. Yeah, well, I still believe though if you made the agreement, good or bad for you, if it's bad for you, you still should honor it and all the way to the very end. At any rate, since we got a such small group and uh, we'll just move on to the next presentation. And uh, tonight I'm going to be talking about uh, WordPress themes. Now I've been doing WordPress now for oh, 10 years, a little better than 10 years. And in that time frame, about seven years ago, I started my podcast, which focuses on WordPress plugins. I became a plugin guy. I watched the plugin environment grow from nothing but free plugins. There was less than 9,000 for WordPress. To currently, there's almost uh, there's over a hundred thousand plugins, and a vast majority are now premium paid plugins. I saw the rise of the premium paid plugin long before it occurred, and at that time there though, the theme I saw the theme system theme, the theming systems are about two years ahead of the plugins as far as their developments go. In the last couple of years though, I've started to have to focus on themes. I used to build everything with one theming system. I used to build purely in Genesis theme systems. But what I discovered was their theme systems didn't always fit the job I needed to do. And I had to cram things in to make it do the job. It was taking too long, costing too much. And that about that time, it was about three or four years ago, I realized that themes had finally grown up in that they started to include functionality in the themes that was easily separate from the theme. Uh, but was still part of the theme. What they developers were doing was they were taking premium plugins that premium plugin offers would sell the developers a developer's license so they could include it in their theme. Once you got the theme though, you couldn't activate the plugin unless you went back to the original plugin author and bought your own license. Then you could activate the plugin for automatic updates and support from the plugin developer. And these were the things that I've seen happening. And in the course of my last two years of developing websites, I've come across many things that you'll want to think about and do when you're putting together your website, especially if you're re rebuilding, rebranding or rebuilding a website, or if you're starting from scratch. Now, one of the first things you'll want to do is you'll want to think about, do you want to use a free or a premium theme? Now there are thousands of themes out there. There's probably twice as many themes as there are plugins. There's 200,000 plus themes if you take the whole ecosystem in. On WordPress alone, there's about 60 or 70,000 themes. <coughs> in the back end of your WordPress website where you can add a theme and get the free themes that have been mostly vetted by the WordPress core team, those are the free, free themes. They work. They might not always do what you want to do, but if your site is going to be a basic site that is mostly for blogging or for 
and basic information. A free theme is going to be great. You could use the one of the three themes that come with WordPress, and that is the, uh, well, I guess we're 2018, so it'll be 2018, 2017, 2016 theme. Those are what currently come with every WordPress install. The default setting is for the 2018 theme at the moment. A good theme has some functionality in it that I don't like. I've seen people take that theme and as developers and rebuild that theme and create something magnificent out of it. <coughs> but again, the problem comes in is two, three years down the road, what are you going to do? You have to maintain and update those. WordPress will do it, but they could break something that you custom coded. And the same thing with a free theme. The problem with free themes is that a developers will often abandon them because they developed it for free. They usually used it for a way to get their company name out there. Sometimes they're college students that are creating projects, learning how to do stuff. As soon as they get out of college, they're like, this thing's not making me any money. I see no way to make money. They abandon it and it's gone. Now you don't have support for it. Premium themes, on the other hand, come with a little bit more satisfaction and guarantees. Depending, of course, you have to vet the companies you buy them from. Even, I've even bought some themes off of Theme Forest where the company has gone under, or it was somebody who was trying to do something, they didn't quite get it done, they just abandoned the project, kind of left me hanging. Not much I can do about it, I was out 50 bucks, away I go. But over time, in the last couple of years, I have found a few companies on Theme Forest that I like. I found a few companies off Theme Forest that I like. They not only build one, one theme, but they have multiple themes to choose from. And these different themes will satisfy virtually any type of website you're building. So what you want to do when you're planning this is you'll also want to ensure that your theme is mobile ready. And yes, there are still some themes that are produced that aren't mobile ready. And especially if you pick a, a free theme from WordPress. And mobile ready is essential now. It is a key component in uh, SEO. And I think Google recently made mobile the major factor in SEO rankings. Mobile first. Mobile first. So if your site's not mobile ready, your SEO rankings are gonna tank. And that's a real big thing. Next thing you'll want to do is you want to make a list of the features that your website is going to have. This one is very important, I've discovered, in that what I've learned how to do is when a client comes to me and says, I want to build a website or I want to redo my website, I start asking, so, okay, well, we've got your features here. Are these all the features you're going to want for your site? You know, they might have their basic features up there. They might be thinking about an e-commerce store, or they might be thinking about connectivity or calendars or all sorts of other features that go into WordPress. And maybe they're starting from a blog site that they've been blogging about and they've, suddenly they're gonna move into a book. You know, now they're gonna sell a book. Well, this book is gonna need connections to Amazon or connections to an e-commerce store that'll connect to Amazon. You're gonna need to have ways of promoting this information throughout the site. Another client recently had something to me where we needed to um, needed to create a form, which is again gravity forms. Uh, their form, when they needed it done, if you scrolled down and it was like the form from hell, because it was just scrolling, 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 it certainly can, it can create that problem in people's apathy. It's like, oh my God, am I not ended yet? And you, when you break those forms up into segments, it makes it easier for people to digest it little chunks at a time, and they don't feel like they filled out a giant form. So those sorts of things there, and how are you going to do them? So you make a list of features that you're going to have on your site and what it's going to do. This way you can determine <coughs> what kind of theme to get for your site, whether you want to go into... Um, Theme Forest, and my one of my go-to themes from Theme Forest is called uh, Enfold. And Enfold is a multi-purpose theme. It provides, it provides excellence for uh, e-commerce stores. It provides excellence for um, 
basic blogs. It provides excellence for a photographer site. It provides excellence for a site that is a combination of information, forms, submissions. Uh, one site that I work with that does uh, an end-fold theme is the um, Sierra Club BC. Their site's built in endfold, and we have so many things happening in that, in that site. When I took over, it had a whole lot of things that weren't working. But over time, we managed to get it working together and working correctly. So there's a lot you want to do and you want to think about your list of features. Just spend a few hours, a couple of days, planning what you're going to do before you attack that. Other things to consider in your theme, and this is very important. A lot of people, I've had arguments with clients over this one, is their font choices. What their text is going to look like. You know, they want fancy fonts, or they want specific types of fonts, or <coughs> don't match together. Or in particular, the big problem now is fonts that they're looking at on a computer, it looks great, but by the time you shrink it down to a phone, it's hard to read because of the font styles. Or they'll get mismatched headers and text fonts that don't work well. And the idea of your website is you'll want to ensure that they choose a fonts that are quite, that are readable across all devices, be it a, Mac, a PC on like you can load up the same website on a on Firefox and Chrome, and they look completely different just because of the font layouts, because of the way each browser renders it. Then you've got the same problem across what dozens of different phone devices <coughs> using anything from Safari to Chrome to, I can't remember all the browsers on phones now. It's like, it's just, it's a nightmare of devices. So you'll want to make sure you choose a good basic set of fonts. There's a set of fonts that, uh, where's the fonts at? I can't read it. Actually, I've got it up here. Oh, there we go. There we go. Set of fonts. You want, you want to look at Open Sans, Joseph Slab, Arbato, Latato, Volcorn. These are the most common fonts used across the internet. They're supplied by Google. They can be embedded into your themes. It makes them really easy. And they have good, they have good contrast between headers and text. Do you have a question? No, no. no. For some reason I thought I, I handled it. Okay. Can you can you embed the type kit fonts into some of these? You can, and I was gonna get to that. <coughs> type kit fonts are good. Problem with type kit fonts is Adobe delivers them. They control them really mm -hmm. harshly, and the only way you can get them into your site is through the code that Adobe provides you. Now this is really great with one big problem. Have you ever gone to a website and you'll notice it loads and it doesn't look right and then it's a flash and then all of a sudden it's all looking good? Mm -hmm. I can't remember the exact term for it, but it's, a, it's, it's called the flash load. And that's because Adobe type kit fonts are delivered after your CSS loads. It can be a second. I have one client site that really insisted upon Adobe fonts. And we got them in there and initially, it seemed to be okay, but then a few days later, Adobe was having problems with their servers, and there was a two to three second difference between the, the way the theme looked and after the, the fonts loaded, because when the, when the fonts didn't load, the theme broke. I can't remember, is it, is it well supported across browsers? Uh, oh, it's, it's supported across everything. Right. It's just your biggest problem is the load factor, right. the load time. <clears throat> And that can it, can, it can really put off some people because they think something went wrong or they right. think you're doing something weird in the background because first it loads at one text and then poof, loads to another and, text. And that's just the software, not the lack of optimization. It's too many fonts embedded or it's... Adobe has tried to fix it. I spent three hours on this client's site right. fixing this problem right. and we managed to get it down to a half second. And it's not due to the lack of my server speed. It, is simply due to the connectivity between the server, uh, Adobe, and the and the client. There's, there's still an opportunity to control the fonts theoretically oh, yeah. a little bit more than oh, just you. Oh, you, know, you can control the defaults and hoping for. Oh, you, Google fonts, which deliver fantastically. Yeah. There's hundreds of fonts right. there, and you can get some equivalent fonts at Google fonts that look like Adobe Typekit fonts. Right. You don't got to pay their ridiculous licensing fee. Right. Because I think, what's the Adobe licensing fee? Well, it comes with the cloud. So. Oh, that's right. It comes with the cloud now, so that's still 50 bucks a month. Uh, that's a different you can find something, or some fonts you can store locally on your site. Mm -hmm. uh, the top kit, yes. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Does Typekit let you store them locally? I don't know about Typekit, but I know there oh. are some that you There's can. There's lots of font. Through. There's so many fonts out there nowadays, and people are still creating new ones, which kind of blows me away every time I see a new font. Mm -hmm. It's like, why do we need another font? You know, it's like we have so many. It's like, and I have my own collection of fonts from years gone back. I think I personally have 2.3 gigabytes of fonts mm -hmm. because I collected fonts for a long time because you couldn't get them everywhere. And that was when I was also publishing. But so yeah, choose your fonts both wisely. This is an important feature. You'll also want to do thorough testing once you get your site built out. The thorough testing is done by, there's a nice plugin that's available called Theme Check. And when you buy a theme, before you start building, you'll want to run this on your site. Put all your plugins in first before you start building out. Then put in this plugin for theme check, and what it'll do is it'll run a lot of good basic code compatibility checks on the theme itself to make sure it's compatible with the WordPress core files. This could save you a lot of time. It could find you problems that might not appear until you start putting your, putting your site together and, and maybe doing custom CSS and other things, but this helps sort out some of those problems to make sure that the theme developer stuck to good coding practices when they were pulling it together. But you, you'd use this after you purchased your theme. Well, you have no choice. You, you, you know, I'm just wondering if there's yeah. a way to do it. Because I probably know if it built poorly. Yeah. If, you, if, you're, if you're worried about the function, the, how the theme is, if you're looking at a theme and you want to know if the theme is any good, go do a Google search, put theme name in, and put uh, performance. And somewhere out there, someone has written about it. It's like whenever I get something that's really piss poor, I write about it or I put it into my podcast. Because I just, I just got to let other people know to avoid. And there's many people that do. So you can do it. One of the things I've learned to do, I've made this mistake. I've probably cost myself $300 or more. Bought a theme from Theme Forest where I looked at everything. It's looked good. I look at their list of what's in the theme and I read everything. I made the mistake of not reading the comments. Okay. And I, I don't always trust comments, but I've learned to read them and keep them with a grain of salt. And then I go down and I go back for however long they are to see how many comments. Because you the bad comments, there'll be a pattern to them. Either their service will suck, there'll be a functionality problem that they're not fixing, people have complained about, et cetera, et cetera. But it will appear in their comments. And they can't remove those comments once someone puts them there. They can't pull them out, they're stuck. It's kind of like all the stuff up on Travelocity and Travel Advisor and what's that other? Yeah. Yeah. There. Yeah. yeah. I can say useless, yeah. so you got that right. <laughs> so it's like those comments there, they, they don't, don't go away. But it helps you to figure it out. But if there's nothing there and I really am interested, I will do a search to see if anyone's written about this theme to see if it's any good. Because granted, they're only 50 to 75 bucks, but still that's money I put out and it's gone. I, if I don't use it for my client project, I can't get the money back. And then I'm stuck with a theme that I can't use. And I've probably got about a dozen of those right now. I just made the mistake. I've done the same thing with plugins too. I've made the mistake with plugins. Although uh, Theme Forest, if you contact them quick enough after you bought it, no you can't. Reverse. You can get a re you can get a reversal on it because Theme Forest is pretty good about refund. I think it's thirty days or something. Something like that. Yeah, I've done that. It's not very it's not very long, but it's long enough. If you buy it, start working with it. My problem is, is I'll, I'll get started on a project, I'll buy everything, and I won't I won't discover the problem until forty five days or a month into it because I. Mine would be thirty one days. Just so you know. Yeah. 31, that's when I, oh, this is, oh, yeah. yesterday. Been that, been there, done that. But yeah, so it's, it's something you do want to do. You do want to also be aware of bloated themes. And a bloated theme is a theme that has too much stuff added into it. Uh, too many plugins are in the theme, too much functionality that you can't turn off in the theme. I mean, you could almost say, like my favorite theme being uh, Enfold, it's almost a bloated theme, except for the fact that they've made it so all the plugins that they have in there, you can turn them off. You don't have to include them. 
another theme I use a lot is uh, eight themes. I can't remember which one there is. They have a dozen. Uh, royal theme, that's the one I'm using right now. It's a e-commerce store theme from 8themes.com. And their themes are quite affordably priced. They're really good quality. They have uh, four of their themes I've used. But the Royal theme has a lot of plugins in there, but you don't have to turn them all on. You only turn on the ones you need for what your functionality is going to be for the site. And it just saves time because they've already built out, like Royal theme is already built out on building an e-commerce store. And they've already customized the e-commerce product pages, the WooCommerce pages, to do what I want to do without me having to pull in three plugins to do the magnifying of the images, add the extra stuff. They've already customized it for me. All I gotta do is add my data. So it saves me time, saves me having to buy additional plugins. So that's why you look at these themes to do that and see if the theme is gonna do what you wanna do. But you gotta be aware of bloat. Some of them are massively bloated and you can't pull the stuff out without breaking the whole theme. I have one of those right now where I made the mistake of, it's in a uh, charity website. And it's got all these charity donation stuff and I realized after that these tools are not working, they're useless for what we wanted to do. It's a mistake, I learned from it, but I can't just turn them off because it breaks the website. So I'm actually gonna have to replace the theme again. Okay, so, oop, I went backwards. Test your theme thoroughly. This is important, as I said. Use theme check. Other thing to do, what I like to do with my themes is right after I've finished, um, right after I've finished uh, building it out and before I launch it out to the world, I run my speed tests against it to see what I might have missed in the process. And I use GT metrics for mine, uh, speed testing. If you create an account at GT Metrics, which is free, you can speed test from multiple places <coughs> on the globe. You can speed test the default setting for GT Metrics is Vancouver, which from here, testing from Vancouver doesn't help me much, but uh, you can test from Texas, you can test from Europe, you can test from Australia, and uh, you can test from South America, I think. And plus it also keeps a record of your tests so that you can compare tests after you've done tweaks to your code or your website or added things to it to get the best possible thing you can. Achieving A's across the board, very hard. I think I had one website recently, it went all A's, and I'm like, what did I do wrong? Because it was like, wow, I'm stunned. But usually what you're looking for is your, your speed and your time. And you want to get this as low as you can. Fully loaded time as low as you can, and your total page size as low as you can. And requests. And requests, yeah. You want to get down your requests. That's where a bloated theme comes into problems, is it makes so many requests out for all the different pieces. And also when you do test your site, don't just test the front page. Test one of your post pages or test a product page. Test whatever is going to people are going to visit the most because they're not going to visit the front of your site the most. On the topic of themes, mm -hmm. um, is there a way to tell how fast a theme is before you buy it? Not until you install it because it'll vary on servers it's installed on. It's like, I can take somebody's website that's running slow on say, Bluehost, for example, or GoDaddy. And if I transfer their website to my hosting and do nothing, I will almost half their load, load speed just by putting them on my server simply because of the server they're being loaded from is a problem. And it doesn't give the, their website the resources it needs to load fast enough. You know, I virtually, I mean, almost every site I've ever moved to my server, their speed has dropped by half of what it was. Yeah, but I mean, because that's one factor in speed. Yeah. I was wondering if there was some way to know in advance, because a fast theme would be even faster on yours. Yeah. The slow theme would still be slow on your yes. slower. Yeah. Okay, okay, point taken. But there is no... There, there's no way to know uh, without doing some research on the theme and seeing what others have written about it until you load it up. You will not know until you load it up on your site what performance you're going to get. And plugins. Plugins can 
plug -ins. Hang time affect your speed because yeah. if they deliver JavaScript weird, yeah. you're going to get a lot of hang time. Yeah, plugins are always a problem too. You know, it's there's so many combination things that go into WordPress for speed that it's sometimes hard to get the speed down below two seconds. You know, I've had a few that I've only gotten like this is one of my client sites here. This is we've got most of their pages at two two point eight seconds or lower. Her fastest speed uh, page is uh, 0.75 seconds. You know, but we just can't get, we can't trim anymore. We've trimmed everywhere we can. You know, we've put in the code, we've trimmed the images, we've, we've trimmed off all the extraneous stuff. There's just, there's a certain amount of stuff that's got to load. Yeah. And you just can't get around it. But if you're down at two seconds, you're pretty fast. And if you've got proper caching in your website set, in your website setup, the person is actually loading the page is going to see half a second load speed if they if you, you've got caching. You know, they might see two seconds for the first page they visit, but then they'll see less than that for every other page. Because if you use consistent stuff on all your pages, colors and images, headers and stuff, all of that will be cached in their browser, so they won't have to reload that from the internet. So it saves time. So once you finally find the uh, theme you're looking for and you've figured out all the little bits and pieces you're going to deal with along the way, your next steps on that is to announce it out to the world and let them know you exist. And that's when you'll know if, the, if everything else is going to work okay. Is after that point there. So. Other questions about themes and what you can do with them? Consultant theme. What's that? Consultant. Consultant theme. theme. One thing I found too about searching for themes like a consultant theme mm -hmm. is if you look for something that's a cousin of a theme, of a, of a vertical, <laughs> Screens you could have something. Oh, so, good. for example, um, a wellness retreat and a spa are cousins of each other. Not because they share a lot of similarities, but they probably have the same look and feel. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. I'm going to talk about family members. How does some um, uh, child themes and WordPress themes. How does that play out? Child themes? Yeah. I mean, it, it, okay. is it something that it, it avoids an opportunity to break it on updates or something? Um, yes. What you do with child theme is a child theme allows you to do customizations. Mm -hmm. uh, you take your main theme and leave it in the child theme. What it does, it feeds into the main theme for all the files. Mm -hmm and it looks for all the files, any files you want to customize, you move them to your child theme area. So when the main theme is updated, and usually when you update a theme or a plugin, you replace most, if not all, the files in there. Mm -hmm. So, and also the other thing, if you've customized, it won't break your customizations. The other thing, um, well still, if they, if they mess it up, it's still gonna break. But the biggest thing is for customizations. So you can allow customizations without breaking. Right, so that would be recommended for me? Oh, highly. I yeah. don't, I, every website I build has a child theme. Right. I, I find it a little complicated. Are there, are there more complications with them? Or? Child themes? Yeah. No? No? Okay. If, if you take a moment to set up, if you can't do, if, if it doesn't, like most themes you buy, when you unzip them, there's a folder in there that says child theme of it. So you upload both those pieces. And when you go to activate, you don't activate the primary, you activate the one that's labeled child. If it doesn't come with it, there's a plugin out there for WordPress. I can't remember what it's called, but it will create a child theme for you. Yeah, you just install the plugin, push the button, it creates a child theme for you based upon whatever theme you tell it from your selection of themes you have available. And it's done. Your child theme is ready, you just activate the child theme. And this child theme, it doesn't slow things down. No. It's sort of okay. No. It has it has almost no impact whatsoever because it's, it's basically because of the hierarchy of WordPress uh, uh, WordPress files and the way it's designed is WordPress comes in and looks for the main files. If it doesn't, if it if it finds a child theme, I can't remember the hierarchy. It looks for the it looks for the the lower level ones. It doesn't find them. It just moves up the line until it gets to the top. You'll look for the active theme, yeah. and the active theme gives a crib yeah. sheet of what the parent theme is. There it goes. The parent theme, 
And basically the child theme is the exceptions to the rules. Yeah. And that's that's the way that's the way it works now. It has almost no impact on it. And it does save you grief. I've had it save me tons of grief, especially when I've done customizations. And it's hardly a site doesn't end up with some custom coding of some sort. Usually CSS. And you put that CSS code in your child theme. So it's you have collisions between plugins and sorry? Or you have collisions between plugins and CSS. Ah, that's a whole other animal. Yeah. 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 Hover the mouse on the plugin, find out what my salary was, write a quick CSS code, and it's fixed. Yep. Yep, the hierarchies of all the way it all works. Sometimes it's a, quite a trick to dig through it. Yes? Right, one last question. I get a little bit off topic, but I'm looking for a chat plugin. Do you, are, there, are there any free ones that are any good? Mm. I don't know, I haven't used one in a while. There's a couple of chat plugins that have come with my e-commerce uh, themes. And I'm trying to remember the name of them. I haven't used chat plugins in ages. I can never, I can never get the people visiting the websites to actually use them. Because you gotta, you gotta man a chat plugin or turn it into a bot to engage people when they hit the websites. Like most websites you hit and that chat pops up and it's trying to talk to you, that's not an actual human then. That's an actual, that's usually a bot. Yeah, it's, they're well programmed bots. And they sometimes, some of the better bots, you don't even know you're not talking to a human until you ask it a question that it can't answer. And then they usually put, try to put you in touch with a human. Um, John, in your experience, are any uh, themes better working with, uh, say, animation and video uh, embedding than, and plugins than others? Video? And animation. And animation, what do you mean by animation? Yeah, any, I mean, there are animation plugins, everything from uh, an animated hamburger to, you know. Is it still in, a video file or? No, it would be, say. Uh, like a GIF? A or a file. Could be a GIF or a maybe um, SVG or. Okay. You know, can you, can you <coughs> go in, in there um, with WordPress or are you back, back into making your own stuff? You might be in your own stuff, but in that kind of customization. There's a theme that I've used called Video Pro, which handles video really well. I couldn't tell you about animation such as the SVG or others. And what about, say, just embedding video, say, the standard sort of video banner, so you can put some motion on it? Oh, um, that, is that theme, theme dependent, or you could say that's, that's theme usually theme independent. Like there's theme, sorry, into something in, in the Infold theme, for instance. What's that? Sorry, you could bury something in the in the info theme that you mentioned, for instance? Yeah, and yeah, well, I, all my info themes, like if you go to johnoverall.com or or go to uh, WP Plugins A to Z, those are info themes, and they've got video all through them. Cool. And they handle the video well, but the theme isn't dealing with the video. The video is dealt with a uh, plugin I've got. Right. And uh, I think the plugin is the uh, uh, YouTube free. Uh, Embed YouTube free. I can't remember the name of it precisely, but it's it's designed for handling YouTube videos. And what the plugin does that I find fa uh, fantastic is mm -hmm. that you have to buy the premium version to make it work the best. It's like twenty five bucks for the plugin, mm -hmm. but it allows you to bring in a YouTube channels, but not just the YouTube channel, but you can bring in playlists from YouTube channels mm -hmm. and embed that playlist and you can customize the display of the playlist and every time a new video is uploaded, the page that's playing the playlist automatically has the latest video from the playlist at the top and the others are knocked down to uh, thumbnails right. and it saves you having to go in and update the page. Mm -hmm. So I do that regularly. That's like this video here from YouTube, once it renders, and I guess according to one of my listeners there, he said that the video was backwards. Mm. So it turns out you can't use the front camera when you're recording because everyone's reversed. Oh, I did not know that. I have, cool. He said the sound was great though. So.
So you're saying it was filming this direction? No, it's filming this direction. Oh. Previously, previously I was using the front camera to film. Okay. I was using the front camera because it gave a better angle because it's a wide angle lens versus the back lens. It's not a wide angle lens. Oh, that explains, you see videos of people where they're in North America, but the steering wheel's on the wrong side. Yeah. Front camera. Front camera. Front camera, it's reversed. So, I just, I learned something new tonight with this. Always learning something new. Technology is a constant learning learning curve. But yeah, it's a it, it handles video very well. I use it across uh, I think five five different websites. I use this plugin for handling YouTube videos from different clients and yeah. their YouTube channels. So what's it again? Uh, Embed Plus, oh. YouTube Embed Plus, I think it is. I'm sure with all the plugins available, there's something if you if you just wanted to embed in video or. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, and, and if you just want to embed video, YouTube or WordPress itself, you can just plunk a, plunk a YouTube link in there and it'll pop your but video. But if it's on. not YouTube, you can do a Move or an yeah. MV well, or well, a Well, this is where Embed Plus works. Embed Plus handles not only YouTube, but Vimeo, your own videos. Oh, okay. You can look at my, I built a website for my father, oh. uh, his memorial website. And again, I use the Enfold theme for it. But I used the Embed Plus video because I had to upload some videos that I couldn't put at YouTube because I was running into copyright issues because I was using this music and they were giving me grief. And I said, well, screw them. I just uploaded the video myself. And it still displays them beautifully using the same plugin. So the plugin covers the whole raft of everywhere you can put plugins or videos and your own videos that you're going to And it the compression as well, right? No, the compression is handled by your server. There's nothing, it does not deal with compression. The compression is always dealt with by your server. Well, I have Cool. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Okay. Well, we'll call that a wrap for this one. We have another one in a month. I'm still looking for a room. I'll find something that's not as noisy as this one. I did not realize the noise. That was kind of a bummer. That's life, live and learn. You make choices, and suddenly, times those choices are not exactly what you had hoped for. At least it's a well lit big room this time. Yeah, well, it's well lit, and also I got a, I got a real, real projector. I got a real projector this time. Yes. Yeah. Instead of trying to use a cheap one, which is great for video or movies at home on the wall. It's great for a large screen TV at home because it's got to be dark to see it. Yeah. That's not something I've learned. I mean, it says it has. It says it had high lumens, but yeah, well, live and learn. Choice is made. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate you coming out. And yes, for those that showed up on YouTube, thank you very much. The people who say they're coming show up. This yeah. seems to be the standard for word prep for meetups, unfortunately. And uh, well, take care, everyone. Have a good one. Visit us at WPPluginsAtoZ.com for more stuff on WordPress plugins. Take care now. Bye-bye. I forgot to turn it off.